I'm going to touch through water to tell you how other sectors of environment equally are important, okay? Okay, so abstract was already coming up, so I'm assuming you are already aware what is a cogent knowledge. A premise which already makes a conclusion. Basically, it's a period. It's a fact. You don't basically talk about or contest it much. Just like a theory. Either it is uh, coined by J Gerrit Hardin. I'm sure you know many of uh, you here about Gerrit Hardin. Tragedy of the Commons, right? Mark Nolson. Logic of the Collective Action. Because environment management is people management. Water management is people management. So I'm going to focus on water, but touch upon the environment aspect as well. So the point here is climate crisis is water crisis. That is something which we all have to accept. And it's a fact and it's period. Let, we have to accept it. We don't have choice about it. So, uh, and if you put it in a simple way about cogent knowledge, we can talk about that water is available in all forms. Water is life. We don't question these things, right? We accept it. It's a period statement. So similarly, we have reached a situation in humanity where we can talk about the climate crisis is a fact. Water crisis is a fact, OK? So I'm going to do that. At the same time, we also have to touch upon what we are doing as humanity. We have set up global goals where every one of us, our each individual actions, really will ensure whether we achieve global goals or not achieve global goals. So rising water crisis in a country that is abundant in water resource and wisdom is worth questioning and resolving. You will be surprised to know the first ever mention of water harvesting comes from Indian civilization. How on earth which civilization really gave the idea of water harvesting and water conservation or environment conservation for that matter is among the world's most stressed country. There is something which we need to talk about as scholars, as practitioners, okay? This is something where we have to talk about the way forward part of it. So what I am arguing for last 10 years since I did my late PhD is that we are missing seriously missing a pedagogy of water, an integrated knowledge about water, an integrated knowledge about environment for that matter. To my surprise, not all the IITs and IIMs, even till date, have an in independent discipline on water and environment. And this is shocking. And for me, this is hurting as well. You, they may teach one module, one course, or one credit, but like Department of XYZ, there is no Department of Environment in India's all the top 10 premier institutes of this country. To my surprise, further your surprise, there are more shoe design institutes in this country than water management institutes. There are more fashion technology institutes than water management institutes, than environmental management institutes. There is something seriously missing in this civilization at this point in time. OK? We have to think, and you are going to start thinking now. OK? So today, we are going to do first co-working, which is the first session of my presentation. Then we are going to talk about the Kogan knowledge, what is the present facts, and what was the past features or feathers, we can say, of our knowledge system, which is Indic knowledge system. Then we go to the future, way forward, and we look upon future ways, practice-induced education, education-induced practice, and where do we position ourselves? We do both of them constantly as scholars, especially if you are a transdisciplinary scholar or a multidisciplinary scholar. Then I'm going to briefly share, just for five minutes, my tapasya on water. So your assignment starts now. You have five minutes. Please describe yourself as water and why we shy away when somebody asks me or you, who are you? Why we shy away to say that I am human being who is filled with water? I'm a bag of water with some shape. I'm a being. Why do we shy away from it? Why do we need a social construction to tell who we are? And the basic fact that I'm made up of environment of Panchabhut, Panchamahabhut, why do we want to just take it for granted? 
We only remember our body when we get out, whether it is heart or rest of the body. How ironic is that? If we are not truthful to our own self, when are we going to be truthful to the society? I think we are far. Jaan hai to jahan hai, right? So first acknowledge I am a being and then I am a human being. This is forgotten in the society because we are in a rat race. And the rat race is something which is killing the environment. And it's, I'm not the one talking about it, right? From Marx to Eleanor Ostrom, the Nobel laureate of, the first woman Nobel laureate. I'm very proud to be her uh, shishya, but then they have been all talking about it, you know. So let's talk about development also when we talk about environment. We can, they are two sides of the same coin. I would like to introduce myself now, which Rika uh, did, and I would like to do it in a little bit different way as I am requesting you to do. So I am a bag of water, I believe, and I think I'm also uh, not only just water, it's a bag of waste water which has some shape, which is a human being. And the best thing I like about humanity is that the water that flows in you also flows in me, as well as it flows in the rivers and the lakes and the drains. That is where we have to understand that the drains are our Nadi system, just like the Nadi system inside the body. Because our drains are dirty, our water system is having problem. So if the water is dirty outside, it is dirty inside me as well. And I remember a few years ago, Honorable Ex-President Pranab Mukherjee, sir, when he came for Gandhi Jayanti, and at Gandhi Ashram, his lines were, my country is dirty because our minds are dirty. And I, I extend it to because the water is dirty, I am dirty as well. Now the question is, which came first, chicken and egg? And there is no chicken and egg in this, by the way, because humans are the only creatures on this planet who know how to dirty. And that's the beauty of us. And that's also the irony of us. Okay? We have to accept it, but can we do something about it? If humans are the problem on this earth, humans also are the only creatures who have the solution for this earth to solve it. Either we perish or we solve. We don't have choice in the longer run. We are the privileged citizens or uh, people of this planet who are not facing environmental crisis. And we may not face for another 100 years because if we can afford, we have good bank balance. But more than 150% people of this planet are suffering climate crisis, water crisis. So then are we learning enough? That's your second assignment. I'm eagerly wanting to learn from you how are you teaching environment, in this case, water as a case? Or how are you learning environment? What was the last time when you learned about water? Because I'm going to tell you what we teach water and how shallow it is in our education system, even till date. And where do we need, or where is the gap, and where can we advance water education in our country? So how are we learning is your next task. And I will put the other task as well, how are we teaching? So this is another five plus five minutes, but it will go all through the uh, session now. So it's not that we go for silence, but anyone who has done the first part may please introduce themselves. So these are your three assignments, as I mentioned. How are we learning? So when was the last time you learned about water and what were your key takeaways? How are we teaching? So what are you engaging in at this point in time in your life where you are teaching water and environment in some way or the other? Okay? These are your broad three assignments for tonight or today. Anyone who would like to go for the first one? I'm Dr. Devayan Mandal. I teach chemistry. I know the formula and structure of the water. I know how tough it is to uh, synthesize water in the laboratory by electrolysis. But I say as simple as water. I teach water pollution and water conservation, but at the same time, I often forget to turn off my tap while shaving. So I waste water in the true sense. But honestly, I'm a human being and need fresh water for my survival. Very good. Honest confession. And this is the first thing we require as humans, humility. 
Yes. Before we change, thank you so much, sir. My pleasure. Yes, ma'am. Yes, my name is Daniela. I am water. <laughs> yes, a Taoism. I flow in the river bed. Due to circumstances, conditions, my water exceeds the river bed. When not flowing, I'm resting in the pond. My consistency is such that I flow around stones, pebbles, microbes, fishes, woods, and so on. I'm floating. Then, finally, I reach the sea, the ocean, mingling and rising as a haze. Blessed me, gather me in the riverbed and flow. Interestingly, one observation and learning from you, ma'am. You say you go and end in sea, and I see sea as the beginning of life. You know, without water, these seventy percent water, this land cannot exist. By the way, so that's the beginning of uh, for me the life. So thank you so much. Anyone else who would like to go for a trial, um, any one of these, okay? Learning and teaching, and even myself. It's the last time I have learned that in the international conference there at Singapore when recycled water was put on the dais. Nice. Maybe New water. Of, You're talking about the new water. No, no. Recycled water. It's called new water in Singapore. Is it? Yes. It's a news to me. Thank yeah. you very much for adding it. And then maybe due to the optimization of utilization, maybe what a threat to the world. But the next war will be definitely on the water only. Thank you so much, sir. We already we are already in the war, by the way. There are more than 300 international transboundary water wars already going on. Not literally war, war, but conflicts within India. There are more than 300 interstate, interdistrict, intercity water conflicts going on. It's just that it is officially not declared. We are already in the war of water crisis. We are also already in water pandemic which is not declared unlike coronavirus because poor people are suffering from the water epidemics and rich people are not suffering from it. More than half of the world's disease and deaths are related to water. We have to accept it. Cogent knowledge. Fact. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes, go ahead, sir. See, I would like to give this answer in two ways. One is that uh, I see that I am water. I am, you know, a water of a, a rain, river, pond, even the sea also. Mm -hmm. So I am maybe a small drop of water, but I am also, I am that also. That is what I see. But at the same time, I also feel that I am going to play a very important role uh, towards bringing value clarity and reduction of greed in the world. Thank you so much. There is, there is enough water for, the, for everyone's need, not enough for greed. Gandhi said that. I'm going to bring all these sources for you, right? like little, little nuances here and there. What you talk about is also very interesting. It comes from very well-known Persian uh, philosopher Rumi who says, you are a drop in the ocean, but within you, in that drop, you are also an ocean. That's about your capability. So one thing is about managing the no water on the ground and the other thing is managing the knowledge of the water which is getting managed. We are here focusing on the knowledge of the water which is getting managed. Okay, that's the philosophy of it. And you are holding a commercialized water bottle. Yesterday there was a news how Bisleri commercialized water in this country. My feeling about water Water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. Very good. So there are, um, there are the oceans. But due to our limitations, we can't take... What we is the limitation? We have 70% no, of no, no, uh, no, no, the no, planet no, no. Uh, uh, with water. Uh, I, am, uh, I am comparing with the, with the knowledge. Yes, there are also so that is knowledge. the same. Enough knowledge on water. You know what is missing? on science and common sense. We are going to talk about it. And also the, the technical part of it, why are we not able to 
uh, drink ocean water. Of course, we do have a technology, which is the desalination, but why are we not doing it like Saudi Arab, like Israel? Why are we not doing it? Anyone who uh, would like to take a dig on it, I don't want to go deeper into the technology, but philosophically. We are using that technology. Very less. Chennai. Uh, yes, sir, that is called solar steels that hmm. you are talking about. Hmm. But mainly when the mariners use it, and they are converting by just an evaporation technique. When a, a, a cylindrical type of bowl made out of uh, uh, glass is just floated in the uh, sea and just simple evaporation, when the, that water gets warmed, it gets evaporated and from other outlet, it becomes in the form of condensed back and we can use it for toiletry and for cooking, not for drinking in, in our country. We are still, uh, yes, in our country, but uh, Chennai is trying for drinking yes. uh, as desalination. But why are we not doing desalination? The philosophical side of it is the concentrated which comes out of it, the brine water is, is, is more than a poison. And still the other philosophical side which you need to and we need to tell all our pupils and people around is what is water doing in my body is what is water doing in the planet. You know, we are unable to drink the sea water or the ocean water because of its salinity content which is 3%, around 3%. Our body cannot take 3%. If we drink water for one day from the sea or ocean, we are done, by the way. Huh? So desalination basically takes out the saline out of it, which is possible, but uh, we are also unaware most of the time that the water in my head is no different than water in the sea and the ocean. These are interesting facts we need, we need to learn. So I think we can move further and we have already discussed this part and uh, we want to just en uh, ensure it further both whether it is environment when we talk about Pancha Mahabhuta or even water, it is not a coincidence that the water in human body and water in the planet is almost similar in composition uh, in terms of percentage. So it's definitely not a coincidence, there is somebody definitely working on it constantly working on it because the whole effort which we do with this body is actually to keep it balanced with the water. The whole day water is taking care of us, cleansing the entire body to keep it fit for the next time. So it's, it's really not a coincidence and let us not take it for granted. Okay, that applies also with environment. I am not touching environment in detail as I mentioned. You can not eat cake by layers, but you can eat by deep depth. So that's why I'm taking one component of environment on water to go deeper with you. And then we can touch upon biodiversity some other day. I can touch upon fish or, uh, you know, birds or any other animals you like to or any other plants. But today we focus on water. So out of the entire water system which we have, we actually have for us, which is fresh water as rightly mentioned by you, so that we need fresh water, which is only 0.3% in the planet. And they are hosted by our rivers, lakes, ponds, and wetlands. Wetlands, the richest ecosystem on the planet. The shallow the water body, the richer the ecosystem is. Now imagine the drains, what we have done to them. And I will repeat, drains in the water system are like nadis in our human system, in any animal system. So we are trying to work without nervous system in our water system or environment. We think our best garbage area is the drains. This is how we eat junk food for ourselves as well. We put all kinds of junk food for ourselves. GM food, junk food. We are just putting inside this body as if this is a garbage yard, you know. And we can relate with what we are doing with the water bodies outside. So when we talk about water, this is the first reaction when we get. It is beyond the water which we drink, that's the fresh water. Water is available in all these forms. We call them visible water. And very few of them are taught about. Very less taught about them. When we talk about water, often the talking is about the pollution and the purification. Most of the time, you know. So this is the waterscape we think we are trying to learn. So those institutions which are teaching water focus on these waterscapes, the milieu of waterscapes, okay? This is incomplete again in water education because we are missing a point. I'm not saying this is not required. Please, please note my words. It is incomplete water education. 
So broad water cycle, which we taught in, in, uh, in school, all of us studied in primary school and then everybody forgot. When I teach water in a bachelor's, master's, and uh, even for my PhD students, they don't know beyond these five words. And many people don't even remember these five words which are there. Can you imagine this was taught in, I think, primary school. And after that, water is not taught in high school unless and until there are dedicated water courses. Five things. Again, incomplete education. Okay, primary school is fine, five things. But when you grow up, high school, undergraduate school, I learned now Ahmedabad University uh, that they are actually having water studio as a foundation program for all subject students who enter bachelor's course. How wonderful that can be. That's my dream of every education system in this country. Everybody starts their education from water in the first foundation batch. Now I would like you to imagine your universities and see, are we teaching water enough in my institute and why not a foundation course? Because then everybody, everything can be linked around because what we are not teaching is this is the water which we need to teach. This is water in total. You know, this is not complete. This is complete. And then we learn that actually we are constantly talking about wastewater because the water in the river, in the lake and the wetland also goes through the purification process for our consumption for which we rely now more on these RO systems and everything. And we don't want to rely on our own governing system which actually provides one of the purest water in the world. We have some of the most sophisticated water purification plants in the world. We don't rely. We just rely on what is told by the media. It's a fundamental duty of any government in a country or any countries in that, for that matter to provide safe drinking water. And we, our country is doing the same. Of course, countries like Netherlands and many Scandinavian countries can claim that their water is purer than this water. And Netherlands has won that, by the way. Huh? Their tap water is cleaner than the mineral water because their tap water has more minerals than the no mineral mineral water. Okay, so <laughs> we have to understand this and trust our own system because we are the ones who are serving our own society. The graduates from elite institutes goes and serves the society. So this is where water education has to be completed. What we are not teaching in water education is the virtual water. Because as I mentioned, we all have taken the train called development. We want to sh uh, shy away or ignore this part of water education. You know, that's the virtual water. The more we consume, the more we waste. Because there is nothing in this earth which can be produced without water and which can be produced without fresh water, by the way. Even the wastewater requires fresh water to be purified. Am I right, sir? So you can imagine the power of that 0.3% water in this planet. So then what are we talking about? We have to save those 0.3% water, you know. And now imagine, go back to your cities and in your dreams, imagine how your drains are doing, how your lakes are doing, how your rivers are doing. You have to imagine that the same water is inside your body. It's not coming from anywhere else. Even if Narmada water is feeding Gujarat or this water is feeding there. These are just words. Huh? It's a techni technology, but in principle, in philosophy, it's the same water that is outside, that is inside you. So if we want to ignore this cogent knowledge about water, we are really pretending to be knowing a lot about water. Here again, you have to really extrapolate it to understand that. The same applies to all environmental aspects. Huh? As I mentioned, I'm going deeper. This is cogent knowledge. This is the fact where we live today. Every fresh water consumed turns into wastewater in whatever form. Now the catch is, the catch is that we are very quick as humans to produce wastewater. And nature takes its own time, months, years to make it back into fresh water. 
I would like to repeat here again, only humans are the creatures on this planet who are capable to produce wastewater. Surprisingly, no other creatures even have the eligibility and capability to produce wastewater. We are so remarkable creatures. So then we have to think about it, no? So this is the fact, what we are doing today and what we are managing water, the whole water management education focuses on the technology, technology and little bit of people because water management is people management. We are really having a serious gap in philosophy of water, making people touch the morality of water, the spirituality of water, what is written in our religious scriptures. scriptures. You, we, we are really not able to do that. Once we do that, we can think about bringing an emotional change in the society and that's where I strongly believe as teachers we are the change makers. We have to be the change makers. We don't have choice actually. Whether you like it or not, we are the change makers and we have to be the change makers. Then we have to really find out ways how to bring a change in the society. And that's the rounding up of uh, uh, doing this path. So whatever we or me do really affect the society. So my little local action is definitely contributing negatively or positively as a global goal or global impact. I, I think we all are aware of the global goals. Uh, we, have, we, can, we will go through it very quickly. So um, let me just take you through a few more Kogan facts or knowledge which are today and I think we all are aware of it. But important question for you to really ponder about, are we teaching and touching them enough in our everyday education? Everyday teaching, everyday learning, okay? So whatever I'm going to show from here are not only the concerns, but are also the disciplines and subjects which are taught, which are practiced around the country and around the world, okay? So I'm going to narrate it through a story but you have to understand that these are also the scopes if uh, you want to engage or if your colleagues are engaging. Present day, we are among the most water distressed as I mentioned. We need to question how on earth when we have the first ever mention in Vedas about water, the same country is most water distressed because people don't know that it is written in Vedas. We have to tell them. We have to know for ourselves as well. So Veda has the first written history found on water. I'm going to take you there uh, very soon now. But then instigate this inquiry whether this civilization is going to do some changes, some betterment on the stage where we have brought ourselves into or whether we want to go the business as usual and then rely on what Hardin said or what Gordon said on just give it to government and corporate and they will take care of everything. Which is not happening by the way. Because we are the ones who are uh, the polluters as society. Okay, so we have to take care of it. Then inspect the current pedagogy which is what we are going to do today through this conversation. And also, uh, you know, reflect upon and think what is happening because the biggest Kogan fact or knowledge is water crisis or climate crisis is water crisis. What are the other ways which we feel climate crisis? Little bit of colder, little bit of warmer, which we can handle. Warmer, switch on the AC. Colder, switch uh, put on the pullover. Water, we are able to solve it because we can afford as I mentioned in the beginning. But then more than 54% of my own country people are unable to handle it. This is what we, I'm trying to show how the water crisis through drought and flood is affecting the country. Again, not ur as urbanites, we are not impacted because Ahmedabad receives water from 1200 kilometers away from Narmada. So I'm sitting very happily and putting on the tap for 24 hours of water supply. Not bothered about how many farmers die at the mouth of Narmada every day. I don't care. We don't care. 
and that's where the problem lies because we are not realizing that my water and your water is same i mean our water is same okay so climate change unfortunately when we talk about the development paradigm we need to also understand that our economy or development itself is affected by climate change let us have that uh, induced and i assume uh, dr anil joshi already talked about the green national product right uh, something which he is devising right i wish uh, we also have blue national product sometime in my lifetime but uh, did he mention about it uh, the green national product that uh, we should start uh, calculating our gdp also from the green side of it because it needs to be uh, really looked through the green national product um, aspect and he has done some work on it and i hope he will share sometime soon with you uh, but then we are already having a loss of 1.5% gdp because of uh, the water crisis by the way huh going through the reverse india is because there it is uh, the reverse which made this land work you may be aware of it huh the birth of this beautiful motherland is because of the river right we all know about it but now look at the water stress in most of the biggest river in this country the red is the stress huh so you already see that how stressed kaveri indus krishna narmada all these uh, rivers are and how much water we are uh, money we are pouring in every year but we are not reaching anywhere again because water management is people management society management bottom up management required top down is not really bringing us anywhere so we need, we, we are not talking about three major things damming energy and extravaganza which is the virtual water huh? everything we buy has a cost but our products do not show how much water is there a kilo of meat is costing much less water than a kilo of chocolate but we don't talk about it we do talk about meat but we don't talk about coffee and chocolate because elites love it but the fact is coffee and chocolate costs more water for a kilo than meat and vegetables meat yes more than vegetables of course but the fact is also that there are more th more products which are costing more water jeans cost more water a kilo of jeans a kilo of dress than a kilo of food we need to know about them okay so uh, the the thing is when we talk about environment and i'm focusing on water here from drought to drown it's a manufactured and manipulated problem by the educated elites and that's the result of the education system because water education is incomplete we need more and more and more gurus to really come forward and talk about water to teach about water and this skewed picture i'm not saying drought and uh, flood is not there it is there but then why it is there drought very classic example india is the largest consumer of ground water in the world 70% of the world's ground water is consumed by india alone and this is shocking we produce 100 nearly 130 times of food grains still more than 60% people are unable to eat there is some serious problem are we producing for export or are we producing for our own fellow citizens we need to think about it talk about it again a problem of education incomplete education we need to have more advanced and moral education about environment than actually only limiting to scientific education and technical education i'm sorry to say on this platform but this is the fact and this is why indic knowledge system becomes very very crucial for us to talk about it because where do we draw references from that's important because when we are not talking about framing the right problem from drought to drown to being exclusive because exclusive itself is excluding you know when we are so concerned about poor people we should be more concerned about rich people but are we 
an average middle class person in this country consumes 6,000 liters of water every day. 6,000 liters, around 2,500 liters to 6,000 liters of water every day. You may say, oh, I, I drink four glass of water. That's incomplete information. Now my wish is that my younger generation people, I am not so IT savvy, they come up with some way and tell every product produced in this world that how much water it took. Then we will be cautious no, as a society. This is what I am really seeking from high end education, from premier institutes. Are we telling our brigades, our youths to really develop these kind of sensitization tools? No, because we belong to that extravaganza group. You know, we want to pretend to be helping the poor, but we need to help ourselves first. We need to reduce our consumption because this is a limited resource of 0.3 percentage. If we can continue to consume more, poor continues to receive less. And as Gandhi said, there is enough for everyone's need, but not for some people's greed. In India, we are still receiving much water to really cater to everyone. Of course, we have less per capita as compared to the world because we, uh, we sit with 16% world population and we receive only 4% of world's rain. So yes, if you think like that, it is less. But when you look at in terms of quantity, it is really not less per capita. It's more than enough if we reduce our consumption from 2,500 liters or to 6,000 liters to somewhere which is our fundamental right as per the constitution of this country, we are allowed to consume 135 liters per day. So if we all, let's say, do extravaganza, and even if we can reach somewhere around 500 liters per day as middle class and educated, I think we can really share our share of water with uh, people who are deprived. But then we have to know about it. And that knowing is going to only come through education. Someone has to go and teach them. The premier institutes have to take the responsibility of teaching them. We have to devise a system. Go ahead, please. There is this starting point where it all starts that in Indian uh, knowledge system, knowledge traditions have have all these ideas, like you said about water. And then premier institutions should take up in the pedagogy. Um, I don't know if you can answer it or not, but uh, my, pro my question is that these problems are already discussed in certain disciplinary uh, setups, like sociology, anthropology, like we also teach water management, rural management, IIMs have a course in rural management. So there are, um, places where these things are being discussed thoroughly. In the morning also, we, I had a discussion with the, with the speaker, and we had a discussion about agriculture and food consumption. So agriculture, do a technical part, and food consumption is a social part. So, so there is this, uh, I want to understand the pedagogical relevance of Indian knowledge traditions that we are talking about, and social sciences as it exists already. And do they overlap, or are we? There is an overlap. If you, if you really look at from the basic line, if I say from our traditional knowledge system, we were always into minimalistic life. So when you say uh, it is taught in the institute, are you teaching the left side of the picture? Uh, you see on the screen. Are you teaching enough on the left side of the picture? We are teaching enough on the right side of the picture. That's what I am pointing out. Thank you. <coughs> See, the question Namaskar. is that uh, I belong to one very elite university, which is the top university in India, and we've got a huge swimming pool, jacuzzis, and so many things. And sometimes when I see those items, I really feel what are we teaching and what, what is happening around. That's my point. And in, yeah, I could guess your point. And the other thing is, I also see certain students there who will not, uh, you know, that they will put some pot. Uh, below the RO water, they will harvest it, put it in the plants. Somebody who will not use the washing machine unless they've got a complete load full. And I, on the other side, I also see there are certain people who will not bother. 
the education, a limited role can be played by the educational institutions because teachers themselves are not gurus. I think the moral science education has to be all through from primary to PhD, but we just stop it in primary school, I suppose, because it does not yield employment as rightly mentioned by ma'am. So let me just go further. So engendering water, as I was talking about, in among the biggest problems in water is that water is a patriarchal problem, by the way. Water problem is patriarchal problem. It is set by the patriarchal system. Again, a manipulated and manufactured because for a long time, women were out of it. But just to answer your point here, sir, uh, recently I was in the Nobel Prize Teacher Summit as uh, one of the representatives from India, and we were talking about should teachers be activists, gurus, and this was serious discussion. By the way, Kalyar Satyarthi was there, Abhijit Banerjee was there, Easter was there, and they were all talking about, uh, and we had almost like two groups in the entire camp of 300 teachers from 30 countries, where some people said, as you rightly mentioned, we are overburdened as teachers, but some people said, we have to chart the path, what we want to teach to our pupils. So it's a, it's a subjective choice again, you know. But anyway, I would like to move on to the fact that unless and until more women are on board in water discussions, there is a serious problem. At this point in time, the world has only one water professional in every five professionals in water, and India fares even less than one in ten. So we so Neer or Nari, jis desh mein uski sahi izzat nahi ho, us desh ka already problem hai. So sorry, I just put it in Hindi, but uh, just to bring it back, women and water is really uh, the fundamental pillars of having an affluent society or a developed society. And when you look at the developed nations around the world, you find the position of the woman is considered for a very high indicator of development. The position of environment is considered as a very high indicator of development. So we have to really change the narrative in our education system. Rather than education for employment, we cannot keep saying that it is like this and that's why I'm, fe I'm feeding to it. We are the change makers. We have to bring that change and we have to bring the change in very, very subtle way instead of talking like in water. So by the way, these are all subjects from different universities, which some I had privilege to teach, but others are also teaching as well. Most of the water education in gender talks about empowering women because women are at the vulnerable side. Now, I, I think we have to propose more power to power to women because they bring alternatives. They have much more alternatives, decentralized, sustainable options. Just have them on board in the discussions. That's simple. But then women also have to be get ready, you know. So professional leaderships are important part of changing the society. Women have to take that extra responsibility as they are not only creators, but they are also caregivers. I am not feminist, but again, it's a fact that water problem is a patriarchal problem. It's created by. So if this is a scenario, I think we will change it someday, you know. So that brings to our collective goals. I can skip through it because we all are aware of sustainable development goals, but then when we are in that race, we are often in the destructive path, which is development. Uh, again, I'm not against development, but development for whom? Just few people becoming rich and still half the country remains poor. There is a serious problem. So, it, of course, institutions matter and individuals in the institutions matter. And I can focus here on we teachers, we change makers, that we matter. We, we are actually ch charting the path of the society we do not realize and we should not put ourselves in that helplessness situation that I am just catering to what society is demanding for. Sorry. We are supplying to the society. So we have really extra responsibility whether you like it or not and it can be subjective also but eventually we are on that side of it more often than on you know catering to them. So the content itself is important. It starts with intent as a change maker, interest that we want to bring a change, and then implementing it in our pedagogical moves, whatever we do, and then 
self-evaluation, inspection, and these are kind of, uh, you know, moments when we do these de development programs are kind of inspections, you know, self-correction times or reflection times, you know, because that requires intent and intellect. You all really made a serious cost-benefit choice to come here and do this kind of engagement with each other, you know. So um, access to all has to be our fundamental way of looking at it instead of providing uh, luxuries and then address to all. I always say that what are a goal is the mother of all the goals because none of the goals can be achieved, the sustainable development goals, if water goal is not achieved. And water has already water and sanitation where women is already part of the serious problem. So uh, I think uh, three steps are very simple in my, it looks linear, but I, I feel that this is a starting point uh, at least in the way I look at things. Accommodate women in the water sector, act on responsible and sustainable practices, and accept climate change as, as, as a reality, as you know, fact. So uh, what has been done in the past can be really brought to the present, what uh, ma'am was already asking me. So I will just flip through a few things which we already have. We don't have to reinvent the wheel, by the way. As I mentioned, the first ever mention of water comes from our Vedic literature, you know. So it, it's right from Indus Valley to Vedic period, and even we can go beyond to even Mesopotamia, Egypt, China, and all those things. We, we are not going to go there. We focus in our own, where water has been the prime mover of the civilization. Whether it is flourishing the civilization, whether it is perishing of the civilization. So if you all um, are aware of how Indus Valley also perished, it is uh, somewhere linked to climate crisis, linked to water crisis. Uh, and it is now a proven fact. So we have to accept that. So there are many, many, uh, uh, you know, uh, references where we talk about hydrological cycle, nature, patterns of various components with water uses, how people should use water, should manage water is already there. And I'm going to give some references, but the first reference which comes is the birth of our motherland is because the river gave us land. That's why we have river as mother, except a Brahmaputra and few more, okay? So it's already a creator, a caregiver, you know? So we have to accept that fact. We cannot really talk about only land development and dump everything into the water. Every waste of this planet gets into the water body. Because we know as humans that land is valuable, we are not valuing the water body enough, the water enough, and that's the problem. And by the way, Drains occupy more surface area than all the water bodies included in this country. All these little lines are drains and are dirty at this point in time. And they have more surface area and to your surprise, there are, this is the least studied subject in any discipline. Nobody wants to study drains. When we study water pollution, we don't study the drain drain, we study the water itself and leave the drain aside because drain comes in uh, the land department or land discipline. When land is studied, drain is left aside because it is designated as a wasteland. So wasteland does not require to be attended, does not require to be studied. Least studied subject. So there is a huge gap, huge opportunity to start teaching about drains. Beautiful papers available, by the way. So anyway, other form of water bodies where we are actually drawing our surface water are the ponds and lakes and tanks. And in the past, if you look at all the water harvesting systems, were done by human uh, construction. We have actually mastered the art of traditional water harvesting system. We, we did not really uh, do anything extraordinary, but it came out of need. Today in urbanized system, we don't need to do it because it is offered by certain technologically sound people who are forming some organizations that they are coming from the premium institutes. I mean, one of the oldest discipline we have is civil engineering, who have done wonderful work, but I'm sorry to say, but then they are also required to really talk, uh, learn about ecosystem because everything is not about construction, you know? And if we relate with what was constructed in the past when ponds were made, when lakes were made, 
90% of the water bodies in this country in the form of enclosed water bodies, lakes and wetlands are humanly constructed water bodies and not all of them are constructed by the way. When I say constructed, I mean literally constructed but when you talk about tanks, tanks are different than ponds, ponds are different than lakes and they all have different ecosystem. And now when you look at today, we are going ahead and concretizing all the water bodies. It does not require, we can just go back to our traditional system and look what is done. So anyway, this is our main source of water at this point in time. But when we look at Vedas, Arthashastra, you know, Ashtadai, Ramayan, Mahabharat, Puranas, you can keep talking about it, Brihat Samhita, Megh Mala, Mayur Charitra, and Chitrakala, and uh, Jainism, Buddhism, Sikhism, Islam, you can really find out beautiful text about water. Just to give you some examples, let's start with animism, you know, tribal people, indigenous people, they always worshipped nature. We imposed religion on them in the very recent time, post-colonization. They had no religion, their religion was nature, animism. So they knew much better that they cannot survive with it and they are part of it. They are not different from it. For us now, nature and environment is different and we are different. You know, that's where things change. Even in Hinduism, for that matter, importance both in physical and spiritual well-being, we still believe that taking a dip in X river and X lake can cleanse our sins. Such a wonderful thing to think about. Then how can we pollute that whole same water body, you know? So we have to think about it. It has cleansing powers. It's not only one river or one pond, by the way. Most of the water bodies. In the past, everyone was not rushing to Ganga for the last rituals. People used to do it in their own region because they used to consider them as holy. But now the whole focus is not there in their own region. That is why we all have to rush to one place. It was not like this even until recently. Christianity, you know, the ritual of baptism itself is a ritual of water. I'm just picking few lines and I will go uh, just few slides for each one of them. Buddhism, water is life giver. Sikhism, Panch Mahabhuta, very close to it. You know, we are made up of these five elements. Let me just take from Hinduism some, some references, you know. Water as friends of man give full protection to its progenies, you know. I'm just reading it from here because I don't want to be wrong in the right words. Uh, from Rig Veda, section 657. Water bears all of defilements and cleans people, you know. Waters are to be freed from defilement. Now imagine what we are doing, whether we are de dealing with a drain, whether we are dealing with a lake, whether we are dealing with a river. Aviral ta mehi nirmal ta hai. Ye paani ki apni kahani hai. Ye samajna humko jaruri. It comes from here, you know. Water cleans humanity from the evil of pollution committed by it. We are doing it even till date without knowing it that it was written many, many, many years ago. You know, so it's there. Waters are healing and they are strengthening, one, strengthen one to see great joy because these are direct translations from uh, the scripture. So you have to really accept the way it has been received from uh, the scholars, you know. So Veda has asked us to preserve water for future generations. It is also written there. What is sustainable development goals? Meet your current needs and ensure future generations needs. You know, plants and waters are treasures for future generations. Rig Veda. So it's there. So water epidemics is then, or the water spirituality or water health because much of this was written that time, keeping water health in mind, that we stay healthy, which we can call as water epidemics because there's a huge literature on water epidemics today. So I'm trying to really bring a convergence what you were talking about, that if we really want to change the way we look at environment or change the way the pedagogy is going on, health is a very, very clear indicator to do that. Corona, classic example, poor didn't get corona. Rich and middle class got it and overnight it became a pandemic. Till even today water is a pandemic and it is not declared because rich and middle class are not affected by it. Very, very simple example. 
you know. So then it gives us clue as scholars that health can be a good indicator to really enter to change the society, you know. Few more. Offerings are dedicated to waters of wells, pools, clefts, holes, lakes, morasses, ponds, tanks, marshes, rains, rhymes, rivers, rivers, uh, streams, rivers, and ocean. You see how they have described different water systems. It's there, you know. Earth in which lie the sea, the river, and other waters in which food and corn fields have come to be, in which lives all that breathes and that moves, may she confer on us the finest of her yield written many million years ago. Very classic example which we all love, very simply which we all connect with life of Krishna is a metaphor of water. In fact, I had submitted a proposal here at uh, IKS that I would like to do a research on life of Krishna and water to see if it can be really brought uh, back, you know, and also Mathura rivers can, and water bodies can be cleaned because it's really dirty there. I did a project two years ago and that gave me an idea. But just to bring it back to the conversation, the whole life of Krishna is about water. You know, from Dwarka to Mathura, you, you read him and you read the metaphors which are made out of the way he fights for things. You can relate it with water. You have to go deeper, of course, but I'm just leaving it here. So water philosophy fi can find more descriptions in all these kind of, you know, scriptures which are available in Hinduism. Let me go further to Islam. One of the major lines, again, I'm quoting uh, the reference also, we have made from water every living thing. It is there in the verse of Quran, you know. And I'm just reading the translation. And this is taken from Dr. S. M. Akhtar from Jamia Millia University because he came in our show to talk about water in Islam. And you see the earth barren and lifeless, but when we pour down rain upon it, it stirs and swells and puts forth growth of every replacent kind. Part of uh, uh, Islam. Many more things. Just uh, I will keep it with you. And of course, I'm going to share the slides with you so you will have uh, the reference for yourself. Water is a community resource. Again, water management, not only water, part of water management. Same in Rig Veda, you have to save water for future generation. In Islam, it talks about water is a community resource and it is a right of all humankind. It's written there many years ago. God has instructed humankind not to be wasteful in the following verse. O children of Adam, eat and drink, but not waste, not by excess for God, loved not the was wasters you know so these are these are beautiful things which we have to bring back it's there it's written there you know so important very uh, very simple thing which uh, is done in islam prophet performed ablution with just one mud of water which is two third of a liter and take bath with one sa of water three liters it's written you see how beautifully and how intelligent and how sensitive uh, things were when we, they were really living with the nature. Sikhism, let's go there. It talks about God is equated with water, land, sea, and pool, thereby signifying the strong divine connect. Panch Mahabhuta, very similar to Panch Mahabhuta. Air has been portrayed as our teacher, water our father and the great earth our mother, therefore stressing upon the need to respect the elements of nature. It's written in Guru Granth Sahib. So we, we really don't have to reinvent the wheel, we have to bring them into the classroom. So moral science or spiritual science has to go with science and technology, that's my message actually, to be honest from here. Buddhism, very, very simple lines, water as a life giver. Water symbolizes purity, clarity, and calmness. I'm giving example from Vajranya, which is from our place, from Thai, from Cambodia, how they see water and how they really see its purifying capacity. So you can imagine we have all the knowledge which is available. That is why we are talking about reviving them, bringing them back into the main discourse and see where can we marry science and technology with these science which is already available. There is science, but then our ancestors had really a knack to bring a philosophy into the science, bring spirituality into the science. 
bring conscience into the science. Are we doing enough? Is moral science just one subject which, you, which we pass in the primary school and we forget about it? My answer will be no or my question will be can we bring moral science into every subject and connect it with nature, connect with humanity? Let us go through some quickly some spiritual leaders. So it's not only in religious scriptures, but even our spiritual leaders have strongly advocated for water. Kabir. And this is the most famous, I think, write, written text from Kabir, which everybody talks about. Bhata pani nirmal bandha ganda hoi, sadhu jag ramta bhala, daag na lage koi, aviralta mehi nirmalta hai. Very simply put nowadays, you know. Just quoting few of them, but I have even deeper literatures from them. If anyone is interested, we can always talk about it. I'm just putting you in front of you that these are there, you know. Let us go to uh, Rahim. So before that, Jal me kumb kumb, this is my favorite. Jal me kumb kumb me jal, bahar bhitar pani, futa kumb jal, jal hi samana, yaha tat kaho jnani. We talked about it right at the beginning, you know. So we have to accept it. And this is another famous lines from Rahim. We all are aware of. Rahiman pani rakhiye, bin pani sab soon, pani gaina obre moti manus chun. I think it is talking about the water crisis. And it is talking about community management and wise management of water. Long time ago, you know. But they were not water practitioners. They were gurus. They were teachers. They were spiritual leaders. They were not subject specialists. But they, and this is what we have to think as change makers. Am I going to confine myself into one subject specialist or am I going to free myself and flow like water and talk about linking the environment with it? This is something which we have to ask ourselves, you know. Rumi, I bring some, one of, two of my favorites, not from India but from outside, but I take this opportunity to share them with you because I am learning about them now. You are not a drop in the ocean. I mentioned just uh, in the beginning also, you are the entire ocean in a drop. We like running water. One of you already said that, you know, for generosity. These are already written and these were not water experts. That's the beauty of it. These were simply gurus, change makers. So we need to ask ourselves, do we want to be change maker? or just a position holder in a university or an institute or just want to call ourselves the way we like to introduce ourselves. It's a, it's a personal journey. Here. We have to think about that. We don't have to answer it to anybody. It's a question to ourselves. And in, interesting for knowledge, not only the thirsty seek the water, the water as well seeks the thirsty. How beautiful it can be, you know. Another famous uh, and my favorite, so two of my favorites out of India, I'm just sharing with you very quickly. Period, Hogan knowledge, be like water. You don't have to talk about, I mean, I think some of you already discussed it in the start when we were introducing. But then what does it mean being like water? In all his 81 chapters, Lao Tzu actually makes most of the metaphors out of water and talks about both. Soft is strong. Nothing in this world is as soft and yielding as water. Yet for dissolving the hard and inflexible, nothing can surpass it. You see how, how strong words these can be. And it already talks about not only the chemical, physical properties, it also talks about the philosophical property of water. You know, just to quickly take you through, so then what can we do? Then I have these few examples for you. Very, very, you know, uh, because I'm a practitioner, uh, I, I think we have to also see what is done on the ground. So I'm just bringing example from some of my known uh, people. So it's not their promotion. But then how they're trying to understand and doing something. So practiced induced education. I think everyone knows him. But not many people know that the first Jal Satyagraha in the country came from Baba Sahib, Mulshi Satyagraha. And it was not against the Britishers, by the way. It was against the elites of the society for the downtrodden and the poor or what we call as different caste. Unfortunately, in India, we call them lower caste and I hate that. But it was for their right, Mulshi Satyagraha, Jal Satyagraha. 
Okay, so concern about water has been always there as part of society, whether I talk about the water man of India, Rajendra Singh ji, or Medha Patkar ji, or even there are many, many, as I mentioned, more than 300 water conflicts at this point in time, when we are in this hall is already going on in this country. We have to know about it. You know, so it's just an example about going in depth in one subject, but of course you can be master of this, another of your subject. But then curating water, communicating water is itself a, a room to do it. For example, Living Waters Museum, a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Sara Ahmad, she is running that, a virtual museum where they are really getting water narratives from all over the country and they are trying to share it with everyone. Possible, collecting and gathering, preserving and disseminating water knowledge, you know. Then practicing at home it's itself, Chitra and Vishwanath from Bangalore, they not only teach, but they are also showing their house itself is an experimental garden or, or place where the students come and see what can be practiced in life, zero waste life. Architects, engineers, from premier institutes. So it's a choice which we make, you know. So some, a few more examples from education induced practices. I'm just giving few examples because these can be in hundreds and thousands, but just to tell you how people are really turning it around. On nature, Dr. Shobha Anand Reddy, IASC graduate, you know, turning lakes into heavens back for biodiversity. So possible, you know. Another friend, Ganesh, checking industrial wastewater, technological innovation, highly spiritual. Both these people, you know, trying to link and bring change in people. So both in technology as well as in nature, you know, both in infrastructure and nature. So people are doing it. It's just that how can we bring those examples into classroom or how can we bring the students into the field to them, you know. We don't have to be master of the subject. We have to be connecting people. Water has a connecting capacity. And we, if we are like water, we can connect the banks of wisdom which is already there in different fields. That's our role, you know. So we don't have to take all the burden in our shoulders on our, or on, on our head. We just need to connect to people. Connect the dots, you know. You always, you always talk about it. Connect the network, you know. So another example. Last year, Government of India with uh, UNDP and uh, CV from Sweden, they made a remarkable, con you know, a collection or documentation of uh, nearly, uh, how many, 41 women from grassroots. They identified them, felicitated them, documented them, and then they shared the information to across the country. How grassroots women really changed the way. We had one in another leadership program, by the way, who was there here, Padma Shri uh, from Chhattisgarh. She, I think she just left now. I had invited her to our class. So there are these grassroots leaders. She's also part of this com uh, compilation. And now from our side, as uh, national president of, uh, you know, you know, a woman Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, we have started a compilation on water professionals from the country and 75 women. And we are going to bring a sequel of the same what last year was done for grassroots. So we are identifying professional water leaders and we are going to compile them and felicitate them. So if, if some activities are started, then the ripple effect also starts, you know. So this is like a little contribution to really upgrade the gender composition in the water sector. So this is a, pro a project on in progress. So, and that's where, where I just want to share just few slides on my tapasya on water. I've been in this field for, uh, since 1994, I will say, because 1995, I did my undergraduate a thesis in Bhopal, where, which was also on water. But I highly recommend you to watch this five minute video by Sir David Attenborough, Attenborough where the video is on what can I do as individual. Because when we talk about our helplessness, we also need to know the power we have. We are drop in the ocean, but we are also ocean in the drop. That's what we need to understand. And he, he recites it so beautifully in this five minutes video. It's available free. Please watch it. But then a uh, line which really uh, hits hard when you work in a subject like water. And I, I, I quote it from here. Water isn't just for drinking or washing. Water has its own spirit. Water is alive. Water has memory. Water knows how you treat it. Water knows you. You should get to know water too. 
that's important. And same applies to environment, by the way. So if we water knows us, then we should also know the water equally, especially I think a simple math should be, if I am made up of 70% water, and that's what I, I'm trying to do for last many, many years since I have my conscience little bit in zero wattage growing, I spend nearly 70% of my day thinking about water subject. Simple math, you know, because I have to think about the 70% carrying this bag of water, you know. So little things which we can do. So, so much to learn, but so far I have learned that water management is really not water management. It is people management, as simple put. One thing is managing the resource, as I already mentioned. The other thing is managing the knowledge of the resource. Unfortunately, the vast amount of water knowledge is still not integrated in a nice way because we miss those water governance institutions. We miss those Indic knowledge institutions. We miss those institutions which can bring all this information from the past, present, and the futuristic ideas, AI for good for that matter, can be brought together. They don't have to generate new knowledge. Can there be a water hub? I think I invite all institutions to do that for that matter. Water distressed, we mentioned manufactured and manipulated, and that can be only changed if women are on board more. So as a patriarchy, we have to change, you know. So then degrading and diminishing resources can be only addressed. So these are some of the basic learnings for me. But important learning is that in our society, unfortunately, or, uh, we, we only uh, respect those who are really doing something on the ground, you know. That is where we as scholars have to also change the perception of the society that producing knowledge is equally important as producing product, you know. And this is where we need to really seriously think the way teachers are really required to be seen in the society. If teachers are making the society or creators of the society, they have to be seen in a very different lens than the way they are seen. So these are some of the initiatives which I am taking uh, nowadays in the last two years. I'm just sharing, not reading them out, but I'm leaving it for you to read it. But little steps here and there I said, sometimes things sink, sometimes drown, sometimes float to learn about water to keep sharing and keep thigh feet wet, you know. So a lot of things which can be done. I, I do independent teaching as so to many institutes and universities. And some of these are some examples which I did in the recent time from engaging with water to water heritage to water sanitation to even circular economy and things like that. So it's possible. So it's not that we have to educate for only enlightenment. There is also entrepreneurship out of it. There is also employment out of it. It's possible. And future entrepreneurship and employment definitely is there in environment and water. And that can be discussed separately. But some education-induced practices, I do work with the government, with the institutes, with the community, particularly walking the lakes and talking about what not to do in the lakes is my favorite subject. Because everybody talks about what to do. I love to talk about what not to do in the society. And uh, of course, talk, I do work with different organizations. But one of my favorite work at this moment going on is this water conversations, which we talk about because it is important that we talk about environment. The way in this country we talk about cricket or Bollywood or other things, we need to talk about water and environment. So some of the uh, efforts which are going on is connecting science with the society with a little bit of conscience and common sense. I think I also mentioned it at some point in time that there is enough science available. We don't need new science. We need a tarka of conscience and I think a gravy of common sense because we have all the knowledge available in the, from the past and in our basic instinct to really safeguard nature. So let's flow together. I mean, that is where I will really uh, invite you all to really see whether water is taught enough in higher education, what are uh, taught, bachelor's, master's, is it degree-wise, it is vertical, what is there, what is possible to teach, you know? Science, conscience, common sense, or all three of them. That is where we need to really think hard and hard and hard and thank you so much, all of you, for your patience. Uh, well, my question is, uh, in the olden days, like in Raj Rajasthan and in northern parts of India, the women, the feminine aspect of the society had more control over water. Uh, 
uh, that is what we spoke about the hydro social contract right now the masculine uh, part of our community that that is the administrators and the government has entire control over the water and its distribution basically so how can we create a balance or or or, or shift the role of power from masculine to feminine or a balance what what do you think about it and how can we do it basically as i am a student of indian knowledge system for the first time i don't have much idea uh, do have indian knowledge system in the trivial literature or ancient times have a concept on population control i don't know really i just want to know because to me population is pollution because giving you an example when uh, one uh, suppose i have one cut of land when uh, in 30 years 20 25 30 years back a family of four people used to stay and now there is a multi story and 30 people are, are staying in the same one cut of land but god has never created extra water beneath the water table so is is there any concept development during, during that time to, uh, the, about the po population co control yeah. that only the way we can control the water pollution thank you so much ma'am for very interesting and very informative session basically i am a teacher educator and we are uh, preparing lesson plans so in your presentation i understand that one topic can be teach in many ways yes in one to just like a topic of water we can teach math we can teach Absolutely. chemistry that was can, the idea yes ma'am so uh, if we can find out some uh, uh, sample like lesson plan we are just when preparing then we are facing problem how to integrate these different disciplinary knowledge in one content and within in 40 minutes class okay any other questions i will take all the questions and try to see if they can be merged no questions okay thanks so uh, the first question was on feminism and masculinity and i think it's a very well put point and argument so uh, we uh, have to really find a marriage between both because unfortunately whether we like it or not we have gone the top down which has which is masculine by the way and we have no way out but if you still see much of the rural areas where top down uh, is not really functioning so well despite the fact that major policies and major funding is poured in there whether it is toilet tip campaign or water campaign we are not reaching anywhere because of the very fact that water conversations between the stakeholders is not happening enough and the key stakeholders again whether we like it or not are the women it's again i'm switching from feminism to women because most of the villages still women are the deciding factors for water where external male agents many of the times they go and really impose some ideas which do not gel well or they are not converging but then we have beautiful example and leaders like nafisa barot i am giving you references and uh, gazala paul uh, who have really tried to bring a very good uh, you know balance and marriage of both the ideas to the community important is that instead of going to the community and telling what is good for you i think the biggest way for us to learn is go and ask the community what you require so this is the biggest unfortunate part of our education where we sit in beautiful places and we think we know what is good for the society without understanding that they know what is good for them can we cater to it i think that itself is a feministic way by the way that's you know so that's a key difference in eco feminism literature you know so go to the people and ask them what they need and trust me uh, i always jump between feminism and women because you ask 90% of the women i also have issues with many women becoming more masculine than many men who are really feministic baba saheb literature i was reading last week is among the most well known feminist in the country you know just go and find out more than 90% women may be are really talking about what i am talking about common sense conscience you know so just have them in on board in the decision make how do we do that by education by giving them little bit confidence we already are having beti bachao beti padhao as an initiative for example it's a very good initiative happening but just linking it to there and then uh, interesting question on indian knowledge system on population control and by the way i am not an expert on population control but because i teach water governance and it often comes out in a very common uh, discourse that population is our problem 
but personally i will contest that this argument itself that population is a problem may be right but population creates the problem is highly contestable because if we have more heads and more hands we also have more hearts have we worked enough on our hearts we are working through head we should not work through head we should work from the heart that's the problem all education institutions unfortunately we all are party to it we are creating minds we are not creating souls this is a major major difference moral science spiritual science education from primary to phd to my dissolving in this planet it has to be there how do we incorporate it now the question comes on the pedagogical design of it you know how do you incorporate spend more time in designing your work than delivering your work i think in i most of you who have gone through research and doing phd or done phd you know that designing the research is more important than researching the design i hope you know the difference between both <laughs>